When Karan Thapar first started out in journalism, you would have imagined that the point of his journalism would be the people he interviews. As it turns out, the point of Karan Thapar being the interviewer is Karan Thapar. He has a style that has come to just form a whole language of journalism. It has come also to reflect on a particular strand that we are so missing in journalism today, which is the direct, the upfront, the, the often combative, but the always informed and respectful. I think a lot of his shows are named to reflect that, from Devil's Advocate to Hard Talk to To The Point to Face To Face. But all of them have at its heart the fact that he was never willing to skirt the issue, but always take head on what others would not. That may possibly explain why, along with having interviewed an absolutely extraordinary roster of luminaries, he also has the singular distinction of having more people walk out on his interviews than probably anybody else ever. The country's arguably greatest lawyer, Ram Jaitmalani, has walked out on him. Jaya Lalita has almost walked out on him, or has walked out on him. Then Chief Minister, now Prime Minister Narendra Modi, has famously walked out on him. And, and Kapil Dev did not walk out on him, but the whole country hoped he would. <laughs> right? On that note, this is a great point, as always, to start the conversation with Karan Thapar on why he has chosen a career in discomforting people. Karan, may we have you on stage. Before we actually come to the journalism that you did, I don't know if it is public knowledge. It isn't to me. Why and how did you enter journalism? I know it was in the UK. Ah, uh, completely by accident and as a result of presumption, audacity, and utter bloody cheek on my part. <laughs> I was doing a PhD at Oxford at the time, and suddenly I said to myself, I'm not 100% certain I'm cut out to be a PhD. And maybe I need to find an exit from what I've got into. So one morning, I wrote to six British newspapers, and rather presumptuously, I said, having looked at them and read them, I'd come to the conclusion that I was the right person for them to employ. Four didn't bother to reply. The fifth wrote back a very polite letter, which effectively said, forgive my language, fuck off. <laughs> but the sixth, in the shape and form of a wonderful human being called Charlie Douglas Hume, who was then foreign editor of the Times and the deputy editor of the paper as well, rang on the phone just outside my little room in Oxford. And I picked it up and he said, I don't think I've had such a bloody cheeky letter in my life. Come and have lunch with me. <laughs> so I did. I went down to London, his club was the Caledonian, and we settled down at the table and he said to me, what are you going to eat? And I looked at the menu and I said, Charlie's Scottish and I ought to impress him. So I ordered haggis. And he stared back at me and he said, you absolutely sure? You know what you're ordering? Now, I could hardly admit I have the faintest bloody idea. So I said, of course, I've had it many times before. And then this wretched thing appeared and it's the inside of a sheep's stomach. It is the most revolting thing you can look at. And he could see the look on my face and he said, you're going to eat every morsel of that and I'm going to make sure. <laughs> anyway, during the conversation that followed, as I was trying to gulp down this bloody haggis, Charlie said to me, you've done the opposite of Norman St. John Stevens. Now, Norman St. John Stevens was the minister in Mrs. Thatcher's government at the time and he had been president of the Cambridge Union and he'd moved to Oxford to do a second degree. And so when Charlie said, you've done the opposite of Norman St. John Stevens, I said, no, I've done the same. I was at Cambridge too. I was president of the Cambridge Union and I too have moved to Oxford to do or attempt to do a PhD. So no, we're following the same path. And he looked at me and he said, no, no, you're wrong, but we'll go back for coffee to my office and we'll look up who's who and I'm certain you'll accept you've made a mistake. So I said, fine. We went back after lunch to his office and he looked up who's who and of course I was right, Charlie was wrong. And then he looked at me across the table and he said, now, there's someone coming to meet me tomorrow from India. Do you know the person? So I said, unlikely, there are about a billion Indians. There were at that time, 40 years ago. There are now many more. Uh, I haven't the faintest idea. 
So he looked at his secretary and he said, who's this person coming to meet me tomorrow? So his secretary looked down and said, ah, yes, a noin toro segel. And that was how she pronounced the name. I said, hallelujah, she's my aunt. And I got the job. So it was a series of accidents, mistakes, faux pas, and the fact that I happened to be related to this lady without Charlie knowing it, and I ended up with a job. So that's how I became a journalist. And you spent 10 years, almost 10 years, in uh, the UK in journalism? I spent 10 years in the UK in journalism, roughly two, two and a half with the time. They took me on and sent me to Nigeria, where at the time the country had just become a democracy. A man called Shehu Shigari was the first democratic president after 10 or 15 years of military generals. And then I got thrown out of Nigeria. And when I got expelled from Nigeria, because the Nigerians thought I was an absolutely darling and they couldn't have me, Charlie rang me up and said, uh, you better come and work here. And I did. And roughly eight or nine months later, London Weekend Television got in touch and said, would you be interested in TV? And let me be honest with you. I accepted for three reasons. A, the pay was more. B, I liked the idea of showing my face on the screen. And C, because I was beginning to believe that if I stayed on at the Times too long, they'd realize I was a fraud, so I needed to escape. So once you found television and television found you, the twain never parted. But in this career of interviewing pretty much everybody who counts alive, who are the three or four you will single out as special? And the special can be for uh, the right reasons and the wrong ones. Well, I suppose the first that comes to my mind is the composer A.R. Rahman. We invited him for a Hard Talk India, sorry, face-to-face -face interview for the BBC way back in the late 1990s, when he was nowhere near as well known as he is today, and he was considerably more shy. In fact, he wasn't just shy, he was utterly tongue-tied. And he accepted on the day that he got, I think, the Padma Shri from the president. And I said to myself and all my colleagues said, he'll be on a real high that evening. So when he comes to our studio, I'm sure we'll have a voluble, chatty, friendly A.R. Rahman. So A.R. Rahman arrived at about 6, 6.30 in the evening. And there was no doubt he was extremely happy with himself. But when the interview began, I discovered that he wasn't just tongue-tied, he was reluctant to even express himself in words. So I asked him the first question, and the answer was, hmm. So I stared across the table, and I said, I asked him a second one. He said, uh, 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 mm. I asked him a third. He said, hmm. And then I said, what's the difference between hmm <laughs> and hmm? And he said, hmm. And we had the most terrible time. We recorded that interview three times and spent the rest of the night with my colleagues and I say, I think the answer to question three was longer in the third version. And that's exactly how we put it together. He's a very, very different human being today. He's discovered how to talk about himself and he's actually found a whole set of words that can make him quite prolific when he talks about himself. But way back in 97, all he would say to questions was, mm. So that was one. Tell us a couple more. Ah, I suppose there was an interview with a lady called Jaya Lalitha. And it began six months before it actually happened, if you know what I mean. I wrote her a letter, asked if she'd give me an interview, and she agreed. She fixed a date, and then two days before the interview was to happen, she cancelled, and she gave no explanation. So I rang her secretary and I said, what on earth has gone wrong? And he said, <laughs> he, he giggled, he said, sir, it's not an auspicious day. So I said, but can't we choose another day on the beginning or the end of it? I mean, cancel if you want, because it's not a lucky day, but choose another one. He says, Madam Wade, he says, but when the stars are right. And we waited six months before these wretched stars came into alignment. But they did, fortunately, and I was invited and a new date was chosen and I rang the secretary once again and I said, are you sure 
this won't turn out to be auspicious. And he giggled and he said, no, sir, it doesn't happen two times. So we turned up and the interview was in Fort St. George and it was up on the top floor, which is where the chief minister's office is. And it was absolutely freezing. The temperature had been reduced to 15 degrees. My teeth were chattering. My crew were wearing anoraks and jerseys and it was the month of July. So I went up to the chief secretary, I said, no, it's impossible to do an interview in this temperature. Can't we sort of tweak the thermotat and bring it close to 20 or 21? He says, no, 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 the chief minister insists the temperature is at 15. So I said, all right, if she insists, she insists. And then we looked at the table where the interview was to happen and there was this huge flower decoration that had been placed bang in the middle so that when I'd sit at one end and she'd sit at the other, I wouldn't be able to see her. So even this time, without even asking the chief secretary, I picked it up and I put it aside. And he said, no, you can't do that. I said, why can't I? I said, I need to look at the lady I'm interviewing. If the flowers are there, I'll be looking at roses instead. And he said to me, but the chief minister insists. I said, well, I'm sorry, I insist these flowers are removed. And at that point, in sailed, like an armada in full flow, the chief minister. And you can sort of imagine it because she's a presence that sort of enters the room and takes it over. And the chief, the chief secretary and all the other secretaries and everyone else dashed to the other end of the room because they had to pay obeisance to the chief minister who was entering. And then slowly I walked up and I said, I do apologize, but I just moved the flowers. She looked at me and said, why? I said, because I'd much rather look at a real rose than these awful flowers. <laughs> And whoever said flattery doesn't work with a woman? And forgive me if I'm being sexist, but so what? What's wrong with a bit of sexism? That's what sex is all about. But, but that interview, at its end, seemed to suggest the stars were not auspicious. No, it seemed to suggest more than that she didn't like me. I mean, it ended after, and I won't tell you the story about how it went, but it didn't go very well. But it did end, she didn't walk out, and when it ended, I looked at her and I said, Chief Minister, and I stuck out my hand, a pleasure talking to you. And she rose to her full five foot two inches, clasped her hands in a namaste, stared at me and said, frankly, it wasn't a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> the Kapil Dev interview. And the Kapil Dev interview for two reasons. One, of course, because I don't think we have seen such a protracted, heartbreaking, um, extended episode of crying on primetime television. But also because once it started, you didn't seem to shut it down. Why did you let Kapil Dev continue to cry for 15 minutes? I didn't let Kapil Dev continue to cry for 15 minutes. I did everything I could to encourage him to cry. <laughs> I mean, I was brought up in an environment in Britain where I learned television that there are two things on the box that are absolutely riveting. Little children laughing and adults crying. And when it comes to adults crying, the cricket captain shedding tears is God's gift to me. And this was a 25 minute interview for Hard Talk India for the BBC and roughly 11 minutes into the interview, tears began to pour down this guy's eyes. His nose began to run, his voice broke and then he was doing this because his running nose was all over his lips. And he continued and I said to myself, because that was the only thought in my mind, this is wonderful, how does it continue? I mean, I've got 14 minutes more of this interview and it will be an incredible anticlimax if in the next five minutes his tears stop, his voice recovers and he starts laughing. So I said, I've got to find a way of keeping him crying. But, but, but. I need to do it in a way that I keep the audience's sympathy on my side and not lose it. I don't want the audience to think, 
currents are bloody shit. So I said, the trick is, and by the way, all these strange thoughts were going through my mind as I was asking him questions, but I swear they were. I said, the trick is, make my voice soft, gentle, loving almost. But keep the questions as hard and difficult as possible. So that's what I did. And we continued, and forgive me, he bawled, and I said to myself, this is working. And it did, and Kapil cried for 15 minutes. And when the interview ended, and I put out my hand and I said, Kapil, thank you very much for a wonderful interview. It was very kind of you to talk to me. And the lights went out at that point, and he looks at me and he says, but it wasn't very nice for me! And he carried on crying. But he cheered up very quickly, and I have to tell you, he cheered up so fast that within five minutes we were having coffee and biscuits, and he said to me, Ariad, have you got any more? I'm bloody hungry. But he wasn't, and I'll tell you this because I think it's important to add, he wasn't putting on an act. Those were genuine tears. Of that, I have absolutely no doubt because he would have to be a Shakespearean actor to have cried in that way for 15 minutes. People often ask me, were they tears of guilt or were they tears of contrition? And obviously, I don't have an answer to that question. But my personal hunch that I've stood by for the 19 years since that interview, is that there were tears of unhappiness. He wasn't guilty, and he wasn't being contrite and trying to apologize, but he was unhappy, and his unhappiness, his angst, and his anguish was pouring out. And by the way, that often happens to all of us. It happened to him, and this is my good fortune, on TV with me. Is heartlessness a natural requirement for being a good interviewer? What she's really asking is, is there a nice side to me? Do people like me? You know, I have to tell you, my mother who was 98 when she died, and I'd often drop by and chat with her, and I'd, I have this terrible tendency of not just asking a question once, but repeating it. And sometimes I can do it two or three times. And she looked at me and she said, hang on a second. She said, you're not interviewing me. I said, but you haven't answered my question. She said, because I don't want to. I've got a right not to answer your stupid questions. Fortunately, no one has ever said that to me on TV. Which comes back to, is it necessary to be heartless to be a good interviewer? You're being Karan Thapar to me, aren't you? <laughs> I'm learning as we go along. Uh, is it no. Heartless, it would be wrong to be, and if I am, then I have to apologize. But what you need to be, if you're doing current affairs interviews, and I distinguish between current affairs interviews and chatty, conversational, celebrity interviews where you're drawing someone out. But in a current affairs interview, you're looking to get people to answer questions they don't wish to answer or often will evade. And your job is to make sure that a credible, truthful answer is delivered. And there, what you should be is firm but polite. Persistent but polite. There is no excuse ever for the anchor or the interviewer becoming impolite. And if he or she ever does, it is always his or her fault. And if I did, I have to accept it was always my fault. But you have to be firm and polite, and that means being persistent. And you can politely say to people, that's a fascinating answer, it's totally off the subject, please answer my question. You can persist and pursue, and there's a very famous interview on Newsnight in Britain done by and I now forget his name, but he's very famous and he'll come back to you in a moment's time. With the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont. And it was about a simple question which Norman Lamont didn't answer. And undoubtedly, the anchor intended to carry on and go on to other questions. But because the first question wasn't answered, he persisted. And the remaining 20 minutes of that interview were just about that one question. And the questioning thereafter went as follows. Fascinating Chancellor, very absorbing, 
but not quite the answer that I was expecting. And let me therefore repeat the question. And it was repeated politely 30 times and at the end, Norman Lamont, who had a grey suit and blue shirt, the blue shirt was so visibly sweating with and wet that it was visible to the audience. And the country was ringing each other up and saying, switch on Newsnight and watch this interview. And today, as a result, that interview has become iconic. And what it epitomized was that the importance of a good interview is you must always be polite, but you must be persistent, you must be firm, because you owe a duty to the audience, which is if you've asked a question, you must get an answer. And the audience is doing you the favor of watching because they believe you will get that answer. Do not give up before you've got it because you're letting the audience down. Who, in, in your experience, did you find difficult, and by difficult I mean um, not unwilling to answer, but just not prepared to get to the point, as you were saying? Who was your moment? I can't think of anyone who wasn't prepared to get to the point because that assumes they knew the point but were deliberately evading it. It also assumes that I was unable to bring them to the point. And, and, and I don't think that's happened right through the duration of a 25-minute interview. It may have happened for five or six minutes. But there are many people who've been difficult and challenging because they actually were so good at answering but not at the same time. And that, by the way, is a gift and a real challenge for an interviewer. Just as an interviewer is required to persist firmly but politely till he gets an answer, it is also the prerogative of the interviewee to tantalize him with a brilliant answer that actually evades the point. Artfully, cleverly, but not without absorbing the audience. So a good politician will begin by sort of answering what you've said, then veer off in a direction where he prefers to go, and then gently change the subject, leaving you the challenge to come back to where you should have been and where he's taken you away from. And this game can carry on between the two, and it's fascinating to watch when it's done by two people who are actually masters of the art. And of that type and ability, there are several in India that I would bow down to. L.K. Advani at his best when he was Home Minister. Manish Shankar Iyer, Sita Ram Yachuri. On good days, Salman Khurshid. And yes, this is very strange. Even though he wasn't the most fluent of speakers, way back, VP Singh. He had a capacity, when he was Prime Minister, only for 10 or 11 months, to answer questions without actually answering the specific point that you'd raised. But he seemed to have answered everything around it, and many people in the audience would have thought that this is an answer, but it wasn't. It was actually an evasion, and a very cleverly, deftly done one. And in his case, because there was no fluency in the way he spoke, he stammered and stuttered. It was a miraculous achievement on his part that the content was conveyed even though he knew he had this physical incapacity speaking. And I applaud him for it because clearly he was a man who'd mastered his stammer and his stutter and learned how to overcome it. So there are many Indians who are admirable, uh, challenging, and at times, when you're an interviewer, frightening interviewees, you just don't see, I don't get enough of them for the simple reason, this only happens when you speak the same language. When you interview someone whose natural language is not English, whereas I would clearly say, my first language is English, you're at a huge advantage because you're thinking in that language and they're not, they're translating from some other. Um, and that hesitation, puts them at a disadvantage. So when you, um, and I'll keep coming back to a few, the, the interviews themselves, but also I'd say it's a lifetime of seeing up close people who wield power, influence, money, all of them. 
what has it shown you up close about what power and influence do to people? Have you found um, strands across the influential or the powerful that you see as a function of that power? I suppose the one quality that is true of all politicians, both those who are nice and those who are bumptious, is that they're very conscious and aware of the way people are reacting to them. The bumptious know that they're at times putting people off, but that gives them a sense of power, and that's what they're out to achieve. The nice know that they're touching on sensitive moments for others and modulate and moderate what they have to say to be able to reach out. Politicians are very, very conscious of how we react to them. It's almost as if there is a second person in their head telling the first person who do, who's doing the talking, watch out, be careful, watch that smile, look at that face, don't use that word. And that's a good quality. I know I make it sound as if it's two-faced, but it's a good quality. It's the same as us when you meet someone and you know instinctively they want love and affection, or they want support, or I need to be kind. This is not a moment to lose my temper. That too is a second voice in our head telling us what is required. Politicians have that second voice in a much more fine-tuned manner and talking to them almost constantly. And that's, that's one of the nice things about politicians that I admire because it makes them more responsive. What are the other qualities so the that I found? the nicest thing you can say about politicians is that they're two-faced. No. <laughs> you cleverly, adroitly distorted what I've said. No, I know, I have. <laughs> but um, so I, I did want to ask, though, where you found the distortions. That was my question, really. I suppose there are several. Um, Politicians distort often when faced with difficult issues where they know that the answer is one that doesn't suit their party's interest or even conform with their ideology, give you weasel answers that skate around the issue. And you can understand why they're doing it, because in a sense, if we're honest to ourselves, when we are confronted with awkward situations where the answer is known to us but you don't want to admit it because it's embarrassing to do so, we all do the same thing. Let's not be holier than thou. We all do. I do it frequently. So why shouldn't politicians, when it actually concerns their career themselves? It's just that when you're elevated to be prime minister or a minister, there is a level of honesty and integrity expected of you that this otherwise natural human tendency becomes unacceptable. If you want to become PM, there are certain things that are acceptable in lower human beings, ordinary people like us, that are no longer tolerable in you. You have to understand that, and you have to accept it. But that's when their distortions come in. Since we did bring up the PM, the Narendra Modi interview, the three-minute interview, We've all, I think, and most of us in the room have probably seen the three minutes that were aired, but tell us the story of how what should have been a 25-minute interview became a three-minute one. I suppose it actually goes back to the first question I asked. Now, at the time, this was roughly five years after Godra, it was the election before he got re-elected for his second term as Chief Minister of Orissa. And I said to myself, clearly, I have to talk to him about... So I beg your pardon, I meant Godra. My apologies. I said, clearly, I have to talk to him about Godra. But equally, there are other issues that are important for the incumbent Chief Minister to answer. And therefore, I need to move on to those as well. So I said, when do I bring up Godra? At the beginning? In the middle? In the end? If I don't do it at the beginning, the issue will hang like a sort of sword of Democles, 
and he will know that at some point I'm going to bring it up and that will affect his manner and attitude. And so the honest thing to do is raise it at the start, discuss it for two, three or four minutes and then clear the air and move on to all the other challenges an incumbent sitting chief minister faces. That being my decision, I suppose the second problem was that I phrased the question provocatively. But I'll defend to my dying day the way I did. I said to him, the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation and India Today consider you the best chief minister in the country. But 140 million Muslims, and that's the population of Muslims at the time, remember this was 2007, look upon you as a mass murderer. Do you have an image problem? And I suspect the phrase mass murderer rankled with him. Now, he undoubtedly thought it was deliberately provocative and rude. But the truth is, 140 million Muslims did use that term mass murderer to think of him. And I said to myself, if I'm interviewing a politician, should I use a euphemism and soften the way people think of him and thus mislead him, mislead him into thinking that actually they think of him differently? Or should I be honest and put to him the actual language Indian Muslims would use of him? The honest thing to do is to say to a politician, this is what they think of you. And he's a politician. He has a duty to face up to it, not to be protected from the truth by me, but to confront it. And so I said, I will use the phrase because that's the phrase they use. And he said to me, that's only people like Karan Thapur who use that sort of language. Others don't. So I said, but let's be honest. The Chief Justice of India in open court has called you a modern day Nero who deliberately chose to look the other way as innocent women as hapless children were burned to death. And he said, yes, but that was just a spoken comment. It wasn't part of a written order. So I said, but so what? Are you really saying to me that what the Chief Justice of India says in court because it's only spoken and not written doesn't matter? And I said, anyway, every paper in the country has picked it up. Everyone in the country is aware of it. It's affecting your image. And all you have to do is express regret for what happened in Godhra and Gujarat thereafter, and it'll be over. And he said, I've done it. I said, do it again. Do it a thousand times, because it's an albatross around you and therefore around your state. It's simply a simple matter of saying, I regret what happened. I'm sorry for the deaths. And at that point, he said to me, Mujhe paani chahiye. And initially I thought, he wanted water. So I said, Aapke bagal mein pada, peeche ja, sir. He said, nahi. And he took off his mic, he put it aside. And I think, I'm saying this from memory, but I think I'm right. He said, Hamari dosti bani rahe. But he finished and the interview was over. Now, give me two minutes more, because Absolutely. I think it's only fair to Mr. Modi that I complete the story. He was extremely polite and hospitable for the hour that followed. I stayed on for an hour trying to persuade him to finish the interview. He offered me mitai, tea, dokla. He was extremely polite. And I said to him, Chief Minister, I'm happy to redo the interview and relocate these questions from the beginning to the middle or the end. If that makes you happy, it's not a problem for me. I have to ask the questions. And I will ask the questions, but where they come up is not of paramount importance. But that didn't convince him. And I said, look, let me tell you another thing. The reason I think you should redo the interview is that if you don't, and you leave me with just two and a half or three minutes, it will be shown as a news item in every single news bulletin tomorrow, which means it will feature 36 or 48 times tomorrow. Whereas if you do the full interview, it will be shown once and repeated once and forgotten. But he still didn't listen. And at the end of the hour, I said, forgive me, I have to leave, I've got a plane to Delhi. And I left. And the next day, he rang up at about four in the evening and he said, So I said, Bhamagudi Mori sahab, I told you that if you give me only three minutes, it will be shown every time. And that's what happened. 
And he laughed. And this time, I'm repeating verbatim what he said. He said, Karan, brother, I love you. I will come to Delhi and we will do food. Now he's been in Delhi for six years. We've never met. And there's been no question of any bhojan either. You alluded to um, the need sometimes to redo an interview. Has that happened? And have you had to redo or have you, have you volunteered to redo? Has somebody asked for an interview to be redone after it was recorded? The honest thing is that I have often suggested to people that we redo interviews because I felt that the interview <sighs> would not communicate very much to the audience. And a classic example, and I've written about it in my book, was with Ram Jaitmalani. Malani. It was an interview to do about Manu Sharma just after he'd been, during the trial for the Jessica Lal killings, and Ram Jaitmalani Malani was the lawyer at the time defending Manu Sharma. And the first version of the interview was a quarrel. From the word go, we'd interrupted each other, and we carried on doing so, and we were shouting, and we were interrupting, and when it ended 20 minutes later, I said, no one in the world will ever understand what the hell we've said, because it was one long shouting match between two people. So, can we redo it, a and perhaps this time not interrupt? He said, of course. So we did. And it was exactly the same, if not worse. So, we went on air, and I can't remember which version we went on air with, but I don't think it mattered to anyone. And there have been a couple of other occasions when I've also felt that people, where I'm not so much exposing or out to prove that there's another side to what they have to say, but simply drawing them out, that I've also said, let's redo it. Because sometimes people can give you incredibly long answers where they digress and go on to issues that aren't part of the question that you asked and you say to yourself, oh dear, the audience will have lost this person. And if the idea is for him to explain something that's important and he's gone on to a tangent which is meaningless and he's going on and on and on, I've often said, stop, let's do it again because, and I've explained why, and they've always understood because it's in their interest to be understood. But there was one classic example when I finished an interview and the interviewee said, can we do it again? Because they weren't happy with it because they didn't like the questioning. And I've written about it, so I'll happily share it with you. It was L.K. Advani. Um, and L.K. Advani was a man with whom I'd done many, many interviews and perhaps more than with most. And we had a good relationship. And he'd only given me this interview because of that feeling that he had that the interview with Karan would go well because I've done so many, we have a decent relationship. And when he therefore asked, can we do it again, he must have thought in his mind, I'm sure he'll agree, uh, and I've got a valid reason for saying let's do it again, and it was that you've questioned me about my successor, Rajnath Singh. Rajnath had just replaced him as president of the BJP, and I have gone on to answer, but as a result, I've sort of criticized Rajnath, and it's not right for me as the last president of the BJP who's just stepped down two months ago to be criticizing my successor, but I've done it, but I shouldn't have, and you can understand why I've made this error. So let's do it again and ask me about anything in the world you want to do, but this is wrong of me to have done. But Karan decided that this was the interview that he wanted to stick by. And uh, I dug in my heels. And we stood by it, but as a result, I broke my relationship with Advani. And as I mentioned in the book, now, 10 years later, I would readily admit I was wrong to be insistent. If I can ask people to redo interviews, so can they ask me. And if someone gives me an interview, thank you, I'm only being honest. Uh, if someone gives me an interview in the belief that they have a relationship with, they will be understood. And I don't reciprocate, then I am in a sense exploiting that understanding. And by the way, let me tell you, it becomes a major problem when you interview a politician who is genuinely also a friend. There is only one in the world with whom that applied. I'd known her since I was 19 or 20, she was 19 or 20 at the time, Benazir Bhutto. 
She was president of the Oxford Union when I was president of the Cambridge Union, and we've known each other from that time onwards. But when she became prime minister of Pakistan and I was an Indian anchor, and you can see what I'm getting at, those interviews were going to be fractious and difficult from the word go. There's no Indian anchor who can come back from Islamabad having been sweetness and smiles to the prime minister of Pakistan. And there's no prime minister of Pakistan who can expect that an Indian anchor will allow her to get away with answers that are deliberate and provocative and designed to rile Indian audiences. And so we'd have ding-dongs, and ding-dongs are a euphemism. And when they would end, because she was a friend, she'd say to me, and before you go, let's have some ice cream to cool you down, or we'll never be friends again. And I have to tell you, it's her maturity, truly I mean that, her maturity, that ensured that our friendship not only never suffered, but always continued. Because she'd understand in the end, there was a compulsion on me as a journalist to be tough, even though she was a friend. And she'd always say, let's have some ice cream, let's cool down, let's spend 20 minutes and half an hour carrying on as ever. And she says, that way, you can ring me and I can ring you tomorrow, and this interview is forgotten about. And I praise her tonight, because I haven't come across that quality in any other politician. I mean, there's the, we can continue this all night, but I actually just before we end want to come to the larger state of the media, which in itself we can continue all night. I think it was LK Advani who during the emergency said that when editors were asked to bend, they chose to crawl. What are they doing now? Well, some are clearly completely on their stomachs and crawling on their tummies between here and wherever. That's not too many. I don't want to exaggerate. But there are a few channels, and at times a couple of newspapers that clearly look as if they're on all four squares. But there are also a few channels that are upright, upstanding, bold, defiant, courageous, upspoken, and I admire them. Maybe not every single program on those channels and not maybe every single article in those papers, but enough in each for me to say, thank God for them. I don't think the voice of Indian journalism has been silenced, but it is softer and more hesitant than it has been before. But remember, that also happened during the emergency, as L. K. Advani pointed out. And the emergency ended surprisingly and suddenly. And there's always the unforeseen that saves us. And I believe and I hope that the unforeseen and the unpredictable will save us. When Karan Thapar chooses to be subtle instead of direct, we will not argue the point. Karan, just as audiences, because that is an important question also to ask, how do audiences demand more from the media? Because while you are reflecting an optimism that I hope we could all share, there is something going on that makes us, and it's not just fake news and it's not just propaganda, it's also not about any one ideology. It is about the sense of collectively abdicating a sense of holding the state to account. And that is the job of the media, and that is the job of citizenry. How does the citizenry, the citizenry ask more of the media to do that job? The real question is, how do they ask more of the media effectively in a way that the media will answer and respond? I suppose the truth is, stop watching those wretched channels that disgust you. Stop buying the newspapers that disappoint you. The problem is, there's always a little bit in every paper that you find disgusting that you actually enjoy. And you want for that particular reason to continue. Deny that to yourself. That is the only way. Eventually, the media will come around when we as a people make clear that what is happening is not acceptable. The sad part is 
And let me be honest, we, all of us here, and even 10, 20, 30 million outside, maybe even 100, 200 million, are a minority. And that is what we have to accept. At the moment, we are a minority. What we don't like, what we find depressing, what we want to speak out against, is precisely what the other 800 million are proud of, want to boast about, and want to loudly proclaim. But fashions and moods and thinkings change. And we have to pray it happens quickly. That's all. Okay. On that note, Karan's book, The Devil's Advocate, is available outside. Professor Devi's books are available outside. I do hope you will use the opportunity to buy them and have both authors sign. We'll take just a 10 to 12 minute break to refill our glasses and come back for Rabbi Shergill in conversation, but even more in song. So back to music and the word after a quick refill of your drinks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karan, for a fabulous conversation. <laughs>